day Man, how I felt convicted Cause the only thing on my mind Is how I wish that I was out there fishing I'd rather been on the water With a cold one in my hand Watching that bobber While working on my tan But I guess that wasn't God's plan Later that evening, a guy cut me off the track and flipped me to burn. So I cut him on myself and exchanged me a couple words. I know, I know, but God's still working on me. I'm a hell of a lot better, but not where I need to be. I say, God's still working on me. I always pull hard, but know that he'll never leave. I'm a filthy, no good sinner saved by grace. I like a little bit of worship and some joy straight. I was blind, but now I see that God's still working on me. Still working on me. I never said I'm perfect. And I'm sorry that I'll never be But I'm a God-fearing man And I know who it is God wants me to be So I try to do better each and every single day But it seems like the devil always gets in the way But I mean, what can I say? God willing, tomorrow is another day God's still working on me I'm a hell of a lot better But not where I need to be I say God's still working on me Filthy, no good, sinner saved by grace I like a little bit of worship and some joy straight I was behind, but now I see That God's still working on me God's still working on me I cuss a little bit when the game's on TV when my team's down by 10 With only many left to play God's still working on me I'm a hell of a lot better But not where I need to be I say God's still working on me I always pull hard But know that he'll never leave I'm a filthy, no good sinner Saved by grace I like a little bit of worship And some joy straight I was blind, but now I that God's still working on me. God's still working on me. Winston Churchill once said, there's something about the outside of a horse that's good for the inside of a man. If you've been around horses much, you'll understand that horses can give calm and peace and help build trust. Horses are great for all they do. They can only give temporary calm and peace and help build temporary trust. Here at East Mountain Cowboy Church, we all have stories about the train wrecks in our lives. Somewhere on our journey, Jesus crossed our path. That's when we learned what real peace and trust was all about. We're the perfect church for those who aren't. We appreciate you joining us today.
morning. How's everybody today? Oh, you're going to have to do a lot better than that. It's going to be a two-hour message. Well, we're so glad to see you today. Had the opportunity to meet a bunch of visitors. Thank you so much, visitors, for coming and hanging out with us. And we promise we'll try to be nice. That's our goal. So I'd have a little instruction today to those of you that call this church your home. When we do a greeting, okay, I'm going to be sitting up here with a tally. And uh, the deal is, is that when you get up to greet, if there's a row behind you, because this is what you do every Sunday, when I say get up and meet somebody you don't know, you turn around and shake the people behind you that you have been sitting behind since the birth of Jesus, okay? So it's time for you to uh, get your blessed assurance and get moving and go around and meet and greet some people. Now, we had a great day yesterday at the arena. I mean, we got a lot done. I think we had six, seven pieces of heavy equipment that was there. We moved dirt. We cut pads. Uh, it's fixing to change out there, and we're getting ready for that building. Uh, we're getting ready for our rodeo season that starts. We have a play day at the first part of uh, uh, April. Is that right? First part of April. And then we have uh, our first rodeo that will be uh, at the end, I believe the 19th and 20th. And so we got to get everything cleaned up. And we, well, man, we cleaned weeds. We did all kind of stuff. We added uh, covering over the barbecue grill. I mean, it was awesome that we did. We got a lot of stuff done. And so uh, it was great. But uh, one of our guys, and I promise I won't mention his name. I told him I wouldn't do it, Brad Bramer. Uh, he came up to me and he said, man, that guy that brought all that equipment, brought a grader, he brought a backhoe, he had a front end loader, he had this, he had this. He goes to our church. I said, yeah, and he sits kind of behind you. Uh, he said, uh, so Brad's on my list. Uh, I'm praying for his salvation. I'm convinced he's not. And so we want to make sure. So get out and go meet people. It's hard for me to stand up here and say we want to be obnoxiously friendly and you all stay in your seat, okay? So you have to make at least 10 steps today when we greet. You know, not one, two, three this way. Now you got to make seven some direction, all right? That's what we got to do. We talked about being a healthy church, and a healthy church is a church that greets people, meets people, and we don't want anybody to walk out of here. We've already begun to make some changes in the foyer, so just to let you know, when you come in next week, the hospitality area will not be in the foyer. It'll be right back there. That foyer is for a place to meet and greet uh, and celebrate, meet new people. That think it's bogged up back there. You all get back there, and a bunch of men get in the corner and start lying to one another uh, about their week and, you know, how many bales of hay they unloaded or how many fish they caught, and they never didn't go fishing. Uh, so we got to change all that up, folks, and we're here to make it a, a healthier church, all right? Is that a deal? Can we agree upon that? Awesome. So the first test is today because I'm sitting here, and we got you on video. Uh, so I'm going to go back and watch the video because we have a camera now that can turn and see. So I'm going to go and put it in slow-mo, and I'm going to start taking names, and then I'm going to come up here next Sunday because, you know, a microphone has power. And so I promise you, you got to be careful what I see and what you tell me because you probably will end up in my message. No, that's just a fact. And if not so, my daughter is here somewhere, and she will tell you that she grew up, and she and her sister were examples on multiple occasions of her life. So that was just my way of kind of trying to control them, but it didn't work. So anyway, so glad that you're here. Uh, it's going to be a great service. So if you would, stand up, turn around, meet somebody, greet somebody, find out who they are. <laughs>
if you would, please take a seat. I misspoke. It wasn't the venue they were looking for. They're looking for events. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. I think y'all did pretty good today. Pretty good. People were, people were making bets how long it would take me to get you to sit down now. And that's okay. That's okay. I always have to brag on your family. You always have to brag. Of course, uh, my daughter and my two grandsons are sitting right there behind uh, Robbie. And that's my daughter, Tara. Many of you have met and my two grandsons. And we have had a big time. We went to the PBR Friday night and had a big time at the PBR. And they were out there yesterday picking up weeds. And so they were told they were given a bag. And they said, uh, we're told to go pick up tumbleweeds. And so they, uh, the boys were born in San Diego. They moved to Alabama when their daddy was deployed to Africa for a year. And now they've moved to D.C. where my son-in-law is at the Pentagon. So they've been in places that a tumbleweed doesn't exist. So my oldest grandson got his bag and he said, Papa, what's a tumbleweed? I said, anything that's brown. And so they just started picking up anything that was brown. And, I mean, they walked the entire inside of that arena. And then some other kids there, Billy Salter's grandkids were there. And, I mean, they tore it up and got it picked up. And then they dug a hole in the middle of the arena halfway to China. So uh, we'll have to fix that before our next rodeo. But, anyway, she's, uh, she's here uh, because of uh, my mom, you know, had surgery. She came out of surgery great. Uh, But she's having a little pushback right now uh, just with a lot of nausea and that type of stuff. So just remember her in prayer. You know, folks, we've had a tough, tough couple of weeks as a church family. Of course, everybody knows uh, regarding Justin Hare. And there was a memorial service last night at Moriarty to celebrate. There was one in Tootenkiri. And, of course, his funeral will be and memorial service will be this week at Legacy. Uh, David will share a little bit about his situation with his son. Uh, Kathy at Tractor Supply, her husband passed away and still have not received a death certificate, so she still can't make plans. But we had another death this week, and a gentleman in our church called, and he was very shook up. Uh, His oldest brother's son, uh, who is in his uh, mid-40s, took his own life. And so he was leaving. The boy lived in the the northeast in Maryland. He was uh, going up to Colorado to be... And it's just a a tough situation. David, much like, you know, the challenges that your son was dealing with, um, you know, a divorce, uh, a wife situation that just was coming hard at him. Uh, He struggled with some issues anyway. And his only way out, he felt, was to take his life. And, you know, uh, the gentleman, I'll, I'll keep that nameless at this time, but, you know, these are our folks. They're our family. And... We need to remember those. And, you know, as we've gone through this series on a healthy church these last couple of weeks, and we're going to get back to going through the books of the Bible, but one of the things we've heard a lot, if you remember Paul, Paul always said when he started these, these books that he's written, he says, I pray for you. And in Second Timothy, he's talking to Timothy, and he says, I pray for you daily. And, and so we need to do that. I've, I've shared with you in the past that Travis Conley uh, you know, gave me this when he graduated. It's a challenge coin, if you're familiar, in the military, uh, the Highway Patrol, State Police, they have it. And Travis gave me uh, the, this the day he graduated, and I've shared every day it goes in my pocket. So after Justin's situation, and, and folks, a lot of the details with Justin have not been released, and they probably don't need to be released. Uh, you know, he, he was shot more than twice, uh, and it was, was not a, a good situation. It was just evil. It's all you can say. Yeah, it was criminal. Yeah, it was inhumane, but it's evil, and there's way too much evil, and, and I have shared this, and I will continue to share this. When, when you have a government that says that uh, the life of a baby in a womb is not important, and then when you have a government that marginalizes law enforcement and first responders and says, let's defund them, uh, let's not respect them, what you do is you send a message to our society that there is no need to respect life. The man that took Justin's life and took the lady's life in South Carolina, he had absolutely no respect for life. 
when he walked up to the side of Justin's car, he didn't walk up there to have a conversation. He knew what he was going to do. It was intentional. And then after he shot him once, he continued to shoot again. That's evil. That was intentional. And we live in a society that when we have a governor and we have a president, and if you're here visiting, you go, you can't talk about politics. Oh, yes, I can, and watch me. I will say it unapologetically. This country was founded on biblical principles, and we will stand on that. We will absolutely Amen. stand on that. And when you have politicians that are saying our police are not important, that they're, they're defunding them, they are taking away their authority, then what happens is you tell a society, it's okay, go ahead and disrespect. Go ahead and disrespect. And we can't allow that. That has to be, that has to be changed. And at some point in time as a church, you know, if we can speak all the words in the world, but ladies and gentlemen, here's the truth. Actions speak louder than words. We can sign all the petitions we can sign, but actions speak louder than words. And, and I told you last week, and I will stand on this, if Justin's life had been taken by somebody who came in illegally into this country, for me, all bets would have been off. Enough would have been enough. I, enough would have been enough for me. I don't know if I'd still be here as a pastor. <laughs> I don't know. But at some point in time, we stop watching the stories on TV and we stand side by side with the men and women who are giving us our freedom and we say, how do we support you? And if that's, if that's relationally, if that's through prayer, if that's physical, we do it. And you say, well, you're a pastor. You can't do that. Romans 13. Don't quote Romans 13 to me. Romans 13 says, respect the, govern the government if it does what? If it is protecting the citizens. That's what it says. And those that try to interpret that, that we cannot stand up as believers. In fact, we'll talk about it. Timothy, Paul told Timothy, you be strong. You be bold. You don't give in to this. Uh, and so as Christians, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we have to be passive. And it doesn't mean that we're doormats. We stand up. We, we have the truth. We have the truth in the scripture. And if we don't stand and take that stand, you know, before we know it, we won't be able to have the freedom to do what we do. And the truth of the Word of God will only be in our minds because the Bible will be gone. And so I pull this out every day and shared last night that not only do I now remember uh, Travis and Kiana and their, third, their second baby, but now I remember Justin. And the more I thought about that, I thought every morning... I'm going to pray for all our first responders and just say, God, you know who they are. You know where they are. You know what they're going to face. And folks, we don't need to just get all emotional in this tragedy and, and, and pray for it in a while and forget. It, this needs to be written down because for the Hare family, this is going to be lifelong healing. And it's going to be lifelong healing for friends of the Hare family and for us as a church. This should, this should cause us to stand up and wake up and say, all right, enough is enough. And I don't know what that means yet. You know, we don't want to be stupid, but, you know, we need to stand up. We have too many passive churches in America. We have too many pastors that are afraid to take a stand because they're afraid that they'll become unpopular. They're afraid they'll lose people in their church. They're afraid that they can't afford because the budget goes down. And I don't care about any of that, you know. If we have to meet at the arena in 25, 30 mile an hour wind because we can't afford to do this and rent this or build a building, then bless God, we'll meet in that wind and set on those. And, uh, you know, we'll just, you know, take umbrellas and rain gear and do whatever we have to do. It's no longer about just being convenient as a believer. Amen? And, and I hope you share that. I hope you share that value. And, and if you don't share that value, you're always welcome here. We're not going we're not, we're not to run anybody off, but just know that's where we stand. And if we couldn't stand that way as a church, if I didn't feel that, that you as a church support that, I cannot be the pastor of this church any longer. You, you just need to know that. I, I couldn't stay here. You know, I just could not because I, I, I'm not wired that way. It's not in my DNA. It's not my calling in life. So I have to take that stand. 
And so I just give you that warning. My daughter, just I tell her stuff, she just shakes her head and goes, oh, Dad, I'm so afraid what you're going to say. Uh, but uh, she turns around and does the same thing. She, I told her, you forgot you got the same DNA, Chica. So, uh, but anyway, that's, that's who we are, amen? And we need prayer, and we need to come together as a body, and we need to be healthy, and we need to be strong, and we need to know each other, and we need to lift each other up. We cannot in these days, in these times, just be some traditional church where people come together, go do church, and then leave and not know this is about doing life together. And so you're going to see a lot of changes that we're going to be making. Got great feedback last week from the message on people just emailing and texting and calling me about here's what we think would help in being a healthy church. And I'm excited about this new platform we've got coming that's our web-based and it's going to be uh, our streaming service and to those that you know if you follow the live stream it's growing like crazy uh, we have larger numbers every week and we're going to be providing for everybody but we will have daily devotionals that that are live uh, that can go on for a daily devotional. We're going to have weekly Bible studies. It's going to be very interactive on Sunday. Our, our folks at live stream will be able to communicate directly. You will be. So we are going to have so many different opportunities to come along and provide more ministry and more service through this platform. And, you know, Clint is working himself i mean he's studying all day long he's on videos all day long he's being trained by this company uh, to do all of this he's putting hours and hours in it and it is going to expand our opportunity uh, for ministry and for care and compassion greater than we ever have been before and so for those of you that join us live thank you so much uh, you are a part of us you're our extended family and we include that you're here today uh, we love you and wherever you are from north to east west to south stay in touch with us we want to get to know you and we're investing so that we can do that and so it's an opportunity for us folks days are getting weird as i was talking to a visitor this morning uh he's a federal officer and he said man it's it, it it's a weird day he and he sees stuff that we don't see and he, you know, he, he's putting himself out there uh, on a daily basis on some major stuff. As so many people are, uh, it, would, it would scare us if we really knew what was going on. If we really knew what was going on in this world, it would scare us. But you know what the hope is? When I hear things and people go, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I'm like, why are you surprised? You're a Christian. Why are you surprised? Daniel talked about it. Ezekiel talked about it. Isaiah talked about it. Jesus talked about it. You know, we'll talk about it today in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, Paul told Timothy, hey, expect these things to happen, and they are happening right now. Why are we surprised? There, there is one church, and then I'll have David come up and pray. But I got to tell you, uh, I watched him this week. It's a big Calvary church in California. And the pastor has a podcast, and he came out on his podcast, and he said, um, <clears throat> well, folks, I'm... I'm sorry to say that uh, I'm not here. I'm gone. Uh, the rapture has taken place, and I am going to share with you what you will need to do if you are going to survive the rapture and end up in heaven. So his whole 30-minute podcast was as if he had recorded this before the rapture, and he walked through everything that was going to happen everything in the tribulation first part second part he talked about what was going to happen in the millennial and the only way that people were going to be able to become christians in that time and this is a mega church and what they have done is they have taken that podcast and they have copied it on those little memory sticks i mean i'm talking 30 40 thousand and they're having their people give it out to the people that they know that have are not believers and he even says, you know, you've been confronted with the gospel. You've rejected him. You've rejected Jesus. And so here, here's what you're going to face through the tribulation time. And I thought, man, that is genius. I mean, even after the, even after the rapture, they're still spreading the gospel. And, and it's not going to be an easy thing. And we've talked about it. If, you know, if, you, if a person doesn't make the rapture, you know, there is one more way to, to get to heaven. But it's going to cost you your life. And he goes through the whole thing. And I thought, man, that is just, that is creative thinking. I mean, that's still reaching out after the church is gone. And we need to be focused on reaching people because people are hungry for truth. And we know they're not getting it out in the world. 
Amen. And we need to be focused on that. So David, come up and share with us about your son and pray with us. Yeah, I don't want to get too, uh, too immersed in details. This, uh, this is the sheet of the app that he was just talking about. Be sure and pick one up back at the table. Um, and uh, also remind you that the sunset service is next week, 4 o'clock at Venus Park. Okay? We need to see you there. It's potluck. Uh, Bob, you can bring your Rice Krispies. You know. <laughs> okay. If you're missing a rake, it's in a pickup truck. See me afterwards from the, uh, from the arena. I want to really say something, guys. And, I, and you need to take this correctly. <clears throat> I didn't have anything to do with setting the uh, funeral for my son, but it's on exactly the same day, the exact same time as Justin's. I need you guys to go to Justin's funeral. We're, we're, go we're gonna be fine. There are a bunch of uh, James's friends and Aaron's and, and others and stuff that know James. Um, uh, and that'll be, the, the viewing for him is Tuesday night at five till seven at uh, Harris Hanlon Funeral Home in, in uh, Moriarty. But the funeral is the same day as Justin's. And so please show up at Justin's funeral and, and be a mass, uh, a good group. That's a legacy, doesn't have anything to do with uh, his family and so on. It's just a good place to meet, lots of room. So let's just let's pray for them and, uh, and respond and help. Also, Wednesday night, uh, we'll probably not have prayer meeting as such at Bethel, but you'll get together with family and so on and be praying and then be charged up for next week as we uh, meet together again for prayer meeting. Bible study will continue, my Bible study or our Bible study on Thursday nights. We'll go ahead and do that anyway. Um, but let's, let's just uh, support Justin's family and uh, Terry and Jim, Tim, or Jim, rather, uh, they really need our help and our prayers, so just keep praying for them. Lift them up before the Lord and, uh, and, and ask God to encourage them and bless them. Okay? You all, you all understand that? Say yes. Come on. Okay. <laughs> okay. We need to pray for Bonnie today and uh, Sherry, which is um, Sonia's daughter, is uh, having a crisis right now physically, and I pray that they got to help her. So let's just pray. Loving Lord, we do know that you care about us. We know that around the world and all around our culture, life is becoming less and less important, at least certain people's lives. And I pray, God, that you would help us as a church to lift up life, your life, and what you can give to us, uh, eternal life, through your son Jesus and his death on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in us and through us and in this group and this fellowship. Lord, just bless this church. Uh, again, Lord, just have your way in us. And Lord, we pray for Bonnie right now. Lord, just minister to her, uh, fix her body. Help her father to uh, get over the nausea. Help her father to, to grow stronger and to heal quickly and to get over this surgery as quick as possible. Thank her for, for uh, Sherry. Lord, that you just work in her life and her blood pressure and, and other things that are accompanying that. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just lift her up. Lord, help her to know that your hand is upon her body, upon her surrounding her heart. Father, we thank you for your grace. And, uh, Lord, we ask, simply ask that this morning as we meet here that you will give us a receptive heart. Open our minds to you and just have your way with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, David. Did you talk to God today? Dennis and Sarah have a question. Talk to your banker, your lawyer. God, dude. 
Did you say, Lord, I'm sorry if I've gone astray? Did you talk to God today? Did you talk to God Kurt's not the only one keeping track. Here's one y'all know. Trouble 
surrounds us And evil comes The body grows weak And the spirit grows numb Would these things be said us He doesn't forget us He sends down his love on the wings of a dove On the wings of a snow-white dove He sends His pure, sweet love A sign from above On the wings of a dove When Noah had drifted On the flood many days Searched for the land in various ways. The troubles he had some, but wasn't forgotten. God sent down his love on the wings of a dove, on the wings of a snow. Sends his pure, sweet love A sign from above On the wings of a dove When Jesus went down to The river that day He was baptized In the usual Done. God blessed his son He sent him his love On the wings of a dove On the wings of a snow white dove He sends his pure sweet love The wings of a dove. Yes, a sign from above. On the wings of a dove. It's the love of my dear Lord And the power of His Word Guiding me from where I am to eternity I feel closer to heaven every day And I get one step higher when I pray I'm so close, truly I can never stray I feel closer to heaven every day Day. Well, I know this old soul has been reborn, and my eyes have opened in by the dawn. Darkness has taken flight when he filled my eyes with it. I feel closer. So close to 
<laughs> Want to dismiss the kids to church, to the children's church on there, and good morning, Pastor Kurt Miller. And Sarah's had way too much coffee today. Well, at East Mountain Cowboy Church, we respect the word of God. In the book of Nehemiah, it says that when they were building the wall, that Ezra took the word and read it, and out of respect of the word, the people stood. So if you'll join me in standing as we read out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, join with me. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker. One who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for worship. Thank you for our folks here today. Thank you that, God, we still have the freedom to stand and to teach your word and to celebrate your death, burial, and resurrection. And we pray that, God, you just intervene in this time of our service. That, God, that your word would speak to us. Speak to us in different ways where we need to grow, we need to mature. And there may be those here today that say, I don't know what that means because I'm not sure I buy into all this Jesus and God stuff. And that's okay, God, because all of us here that have, we've been in that same situation. And we pray it in your name. Amen. A couple things real quick I failed to mention. Go ahead and you can sit unless you want to stand for the next three hours. Um, <laughs> Men, every Saturday, first Saturday of the month, we have a men's breakfast, and it's at Chili Hills in Moriarty, and we take up one section, uh, the east section of the restaurant. We get together, and we just eat breakfast. We fellowship together. We have a short devotional. We drink a lot of coffee, and we talk. So, men, you're welcome there. Uh, it's about an hour or an hour and a half at most, depending on how uh, how many people want to just keep talking? You can stay there all day, but it's just a time for men to get together and for men to fellowship and connect the way that men do. You know, ladies, they have their things that they do. They have the luncheons that they have. They have Bible studies they get to. They completely communicate differently than we men. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, so that was a joke. You'll catch it. That's, some of you got that joke by freight, I can tell. It's, it's on its way. Uh, but uh, we just get together and have a good time. Men connect differently. It's a good time to get to meet men. You can stay as long as you want as well. One of the things that I mentioned to you a while back is that we are looking for golf carts. Because when we get to our new property, some of you really don't understand where the building is going to be kind of up on the hill on the southeast side uh, of the property there and looking down toward the arena. There's a lot of parking out there, folks. I mean, there's, what, Bob, a couple acres or more of just parking. And there's going to be a lot of gravel. And, I mean, it's, it, there'll be more parking spaces than, you know, the auditorium you know, will sit if we do it legally. Uh, and, but, you know, there's grace, and God will you know, forgive us if we, you know, you didn't hear that here. Take that off recording. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, we're, we want golf cart carts so we can transport people, and that's part of one of the things we do. And so if you know of any golf carts, or if they're broken, they're run down, we got golf cart expert mechanics in our church. It's a spiritual gift. Uh, and so uh, we've got guys, and if Jerry Fisher see him, and he's got some buddies, and they love to work on those golf carts, and we'll get them all fixed up. You're going to start to see some movement uh, at the arena with those buildings. They're going to kind of disappear down in the hole, and we're getting ready to take off and, and get that thing going. So let me just say one more thing. Uh, folks, we are the Harris family. We are. And as David said, Legacy is a place that they're having it because they couldn't have it at other places. Um, and, you know, they'll be involved in the service, but we know these people. They are our folks. We've done life with these people. We've done ministry with these people. Uh, I am going to encourage you to do whatever you can Amen. to be there. And I thank David uh, for his heart in this matter. I thank him. He called me and said, Kurt, you know, this has got to be done. And I said, well, then, you know, I'd like for you to share that. And, and it's not there uh, for any other reason is for when that family, the Hare family gets up and they look out there that they just don't see political dignitaries, which 
the governor's going to be there, and uh, she's going to speak, uh, but I get to speak after her. <laughs> so, uh, and the pastor is going to speak at Legacy, but we're their family, so there's going to be a lot of dignitaries, there's going to be a lot of law enforcement, first responders, but you know what would be awesome is that for Jim and Terry, when they get up to speak, when they look out and they see their family. That will be massive. And I know it may be inconvenient, but folks, it's inconvenient to be a believer anyway. And it would be awesome for them to look out there and see your faces and see their family, you know, to come around them. And our hearts, David, will be with you. And I encourage you to go Tuesday night uh, in Moriarty and just be there with, with David and, and the family and pay honor to James. I'll be there. But, folks, this is what church is about, okay? And we talked last week about healthy church. I can tell you of healthy churches that run thousands that the people in the church are suing each other, okay? I can tell you about churches that run in the tens of thousands, that, that I know what's going on behind the scenes and it's not ethical and it's not moral and I know that because I know people because I've been doing this for 45 years and I was in that environment for a long time of my life. I, I can tell you they may be big but they're not healthy. They have compromised the scripture. They're not teaching the truth. Their numbers are growing because people can say, hey, I can go to church and I can have my world life justified uh, by the pastor because he doesn't confront truth. And so, you know, we're going to talk about false teachers, but we're also going to talk about false disciples because there are false disciples. So we need to be there in force, you know, in force. Uh, and I know a lot of other people are going to be there, but if there's a crowd of people that should outshine any other group of people there it should be their church family so i'm going to ask you to step up and make that sacrifice you know if you have to take time off of work take it you know you go well that's my living you know what honor god and god will honor you support the family of god and god will honor you don't worry about those things come around these people they're our family and we need, we need to make this big step. You know, in five years, we've never had any tragedies. Do you know that? In five years, we've never had any deaths. We've had people that have gotten sick. We've seen people get healed. But we've never had any tragedies such as we've had in the last two weeks with the deaths and the type of deaths. And now we as a church, it's time for us to show our maturity and our love, not only for our body, for one another, but for the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen? So we need to step up. And I encourage you and I hope, you, I hope you'll see you there on Sunday. Well, we're back into uh, First Tim, Second Timothy. If you're visiting with us, I don't know how long ago we started this. I've just, I've just lost control or lost time. But we started going through every book of the Bible. We went through all the Old Testament. We went through Old Testament books pretty quick. Because there was a lot of historical stuff that tied into the New Testament. We got in the New Testament and we started dealing with real application stuff. Now, I'm not saying there's no application in the Old Testament. There definitely is. But when you get into the New Testament and you get into after the death and, of Jesus and burial and resurrection of Jesus, then the church starts and, and that's a whole nother era for us in, in the church age. I believe there was the law time, the age, and then there's the church age, and that we're in the church age. Old Testament, people had to live by the law to prove their faith, you know. And in the New Testament, because of Jesus, we live by grace. And so when you get into the New Testament, you start getting into a lot of the way the daily living disciplines. In fact, first and second Timothy are known as the doctrinal books. 2 Timothy is the last official word of Paul before he was killed. And so Timothy was the guy that he mentored. And so the words that are in 2 Timothy is, is in 1 Timothy as well were encouragement to Paul or to Timothy. Timothy was a young guy. If you'll remember, he grew up in a small town. Uh, his dad was a Greek. Uh, his mother uh, was a Jew. And so he was in a blended family that wasn't very popular. Greeks didn't like the Jews. Jews didn't like the Greeks. And Timothy basically is a half-breed. 
All right? And he wasn't very popular because of that. But he had a mother and a grandmother. His dad was basically kind of out of the scene. He was a Greek, Greek god. They had their Greek philosophy. So he was getting that teaching from his father if that existed. But it says, and, and Paul says here in 2 Timothy, that he thanks God for his mother and his grandmother for teaching him about Jesus. And the story goes that as a young man, probably in his uh, early teens, you know, 14 or 15, uh, that Paul came to his hometown. Paul spoke. Uh, Timothy was just mesmerized by that and felt that God had called him. He hooked up with Paul and he followed Paul. Paul saw a young man that had a heart and commitment for God. And so Paul taught him. He discipled him. He raised him up. Timothy was with him always. And so here Paul is writing his last writing, his last words in 2 Timothy. And he goes through and he talks about all the things that, that God has used Paul for, which we know because we've been in all the writings that he's written. And, and, and this book ends Paul's writings and then it gets into, because remember the, the Bible is not chronological. So we get done with 2 Timothy, then we'll get into some smaller books, we'll go through quickly, then the big next book is Hebrews, and I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, they, a lot of people think, well, we don't know, I believe Paul, because of the style of his writing, lines up with the style of Paul's writing, and then we get into some smaller books, and if my count is correct, I think we're nine, ten books away, and on one, you know, a couple Sundays, we're going to cover three books, maybe four books in one Sunday, because they're small, and we'll get through the Old Testament. So, Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him, all right? And just like we just saw the light, <laughs> Timothy saw the light. That was a God thing. No man did that. Uh, and so, in this, in this thing, Paul really lays it out for Timothy. These are his last words. One of the sad things when you read and study the history of Paul's life, because what we just see here we get a, a good glimpse of Paul in all of his writings. But, you know, there are other writings about Paul. There are other writings about Jesus. They, they call writings of antiquity of other people that wrote about. So there's kind of this behind-the-scenes stuff because Paul didn't put a lot of his life in there. He put bits and pieces of it. But you can go study and really see a lot more about Paul. It's like a, there's other writings out there. Same with Jesus, historians, Josephus. And I've shared that Josephus was hired by the Romans to document the life of Jesus and follow Christians to disprove it. Josephus was a scholar. He was, uh, he was very well known as a philosopher, and they had great respect for him. And Josephus couldn't dispute it. Everything he wrote led to the proof of Jesus. And even though his conclusion was that Jesus was Jesus and Paul was Paul, the problem was, best we know, Josephus never became a believer. And that's the challenge that some people have today. They are so embedded and so ingrained in their thought process that they think that it's true because they were raised that way and they feel they'll be disloyal if they step outside of that thought process. It's not only just in religion, but it's in politics. There are people that will be die hard, whatever. Well, why? Because I was raised that way. Wrong reason. Stand on your own two feet as an adult. Know what you're about. Know your belief system. And people just do that. And people get, have you ever dealt with somebody that believes differently with you religiously or politically? And when you challenge their why, they just, they don't, you know, that's all they can do. You know, they, they, they have no legitimate reason. And, and if you challenge their belief system, whether it's a spiritual thing or it's a political thing, you know what? They get mad. Yeah, get mad. They get emotional. You know why? Because they don't understand what they believe. They just think, because I was, and I'll be disloyal to my family. I'll be disloyal to the church. I'll be disloyal, whatever, whatever. And that, that's more prevalent in our society today. We live in a world which is almost... I'll take that back. We live in a world that is shaped by uh, trends. Do we not? We live in a world that's shaped by phenomena. I don't get it. I, I obviously, I'm not smart enough to get some of them. 
Let me share a phenomena that I completely don't get. Taylor Swift. Do you get it? Yeah, thank you. We got a teenage young lady over here shaking her head and going, I don't get it. Taylor Swift. I, I don't get the phenomena. I don't get it. Do, 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 you, do you know? Yeah, she's an idol. You know, she's, she's literally an idol. I mean, adult women, adult men are just, I mean, men. It's like, seriously? I don't get it. And then, of course, she steps along and starts dating a football player. And it changed the NFL. A woman changed the NFL. <laughs> announcer saying, now I travel so much. I heard an announcer on Fox News. I travel so much that I don't get to see my kids as much. But now my kids are calling me on the road because they're now following football because of, travel, uh, because of, of Travis Kelsey or whatever his name is and Taylor Swift. Are you serious? Fashion design because what she wears to a football game. A phenomenon. Tickets selling for $2,500, $4,000. An interview had gone out with, it wasn't an interview, it was somebody captured on, on, on their phone a conversation that she was having with her father, which was very emotional. You could see just a short picture of him, and you could tell that he was just like, ugh. And they had the camera on her, and she's red-eyed, she's teary, she's upset. And I'd seen it a while back, but it's back out there. And she is saying, the dad is saying, how can you support that person? It's a political thing. And so she responds, because she can't support, and this is not an endorsement for any political candidate, so understand that. She says that she cannot support Trump because she tells her dad she has to be on the right side of history. And now listen to this. Listen to this. Okay, this is a quote. She said, I am a Christian. I don't think so. Why? Because the things that the Bible says is wrong and calls sin, she supports. She stood up for she said, now listen, listen, this, this, this cracks me up. I know, I know pastors, I have friends in Tennessee, and I bet you they love this. She said, I'm a Christian because of the values of a Tennessee Christian. I am right. So apparently, the values of a Tennessee Christian are not the same values of any other state. Because her values as a Tennessee Christian puts her on the right side of history and allows her to support the things that the Bible flat out speak against. Now, I'm sure my buddies in Tennessee are going, what? There must be a code written in the Tennessee Constitution Defining what the values of a Tennessee Christian are, because if it's according to her, her values of a Tennessee Christian are satanic values. And that's the bottom line. And yet, millions of people follow this girl. Millions of people pay ridiculous prices to go to these concerts. Thousands of people have been hurt at her concerts. People pass out at these concerts because she is a phenomena that has captivated the hearts of young girls and women and men. Now, I'm just going to say it. The values of that young lady have nothing to do with Scripture, but had everything to do with the things that Satan has authored implemented and support I would call her a false disciple a false disciple is somebody like Taylor Swift that wants to say they're a Christian 
but yet they still have a love for worldly things. Their love is on prestige. Their love is on money. Their love is on things of the world. They, they want to keep up with the Joneses. They, they want to have things in their life that says to the rest of the world, look at me and what I've done. That is a false disciple. Just because somebody says, I watch church, I go to church, yet you look at their life and that life does more to support the way of the world and their identity than the way of their identity according to Christ is a false disciple and our world is full of them. And the problem with a false disciple is they are spreading a false message of the gospel. They, they, they want to say they identify with what the scripture says and what a preacher says or what a teacher says, but then they want to go out and make sure that they get to hang on to the things of the world. And what did Jesus teach about that? Well, it's obvious what he teaches. He said, well, you gain the whole world and lose your soul. That means you lose your family. You, learn, you lose your purpose. You lose your identity. Because in this world, folks, we cannot have our true identity because we are created by the Alpha and the Omega. As the song said, the giver of life. I love the part. You went to your doctor and didn't learn much? Well, <laughs> yeah. 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 He's a creator of life. There are no biological experiments by God that failed. We are created in his image, not physically, but we are as when you become a believer. And I've shared this. And I'm going to go back. When Adam was made, what does the scripture say in Genesis? God did what? He breathed a breath of life into Adam. And he came alive. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, how do I go back in the womb and get born again? And Jesus said, it's not by that, but it's by the Spirit. So when we become a believer and we make that decision to accept Christ into our life, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that's his role, breathes the life of God into us and we become a whole person according to the Scripture. Body, soul, and mind. We spiritually are born. Hebrews says it's appointed once for man to die, not twice. But there will be millions of people that will die twice because they will die a physical death, but they will die a spiritual death because the breath of God has never been breathed into them. But it's only appointed for one death, and that's the physical death. So when the Spirit of God breathes into you and I, then we begin to have the, what I would call the spiritual DNA of the Creator. Each of us are created differently, which speaks to the nature of God. He gives you a personality. He, he cleans up the personality. He cleans up the values. He cleans up the things that are important to you. The things that are in this wor world no longer become important, but now we will understand that we are not of this world, but we are just citizens. You go down the road here in, in Albuquerque, and you'll see off there's a church, and it used to call, be called Cooper Ridge or Copper ridge or something now it says the citizens church you know how that happened and evangelist came in to do a revival and this has happened in the last couple of years and 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 in, and in and in Ephesians remember what Paul said we are not citizens of this world <laughs> and so the evangelist challenged the pastor and staff to change it to the citizens church to recognize that we're citizens not of this world but of God's kingdom and so they changed their name to citizens to identify them as a church, not of this world, but of the kingdom of God. And so when we come into that, then we begin to move. Problem is, is that there are many people that say, well, I prayed the prayer, 
But yet, once again, biblically, it's not my opinion, folks. You can go find it in Scripture. You know, go read Galatians 5. What's it talk about? It talks about what did Jesus say? They'll know us by what? Our fruits. Our fruits. And so in Galatians 5, it lists the fruits of the world and it lists the fruits of the Spirit. Do you know how those fruits are bore? Because of faith. We'll read and we get into James and John. Our faith leads to our actions, and our actions are what develop the fruit. We're not saved by the works. Faith comes first, and the faith then motivates us to do good works. And good works represent the faith we have in Christ. Now understand what those, what those good works are. Go do the study on Galatians 5, and verses, I believe, at 18 through the end of the chapter. The verses before that identify the world. Anybody, anybody can be nice and do nice things. But when a believer does it, there's a different presence about how the person does it. There, there, there's a different attitude about how we do it. And so we live in these phenomena. Well, Paul was writing in 2 Timothy to Timothy because they were dealing with these phenomena. They once again, you know, remember we've talked about all the false teachers and if you're visiting with us, you know, you can go back onto YouTube and backtrack and catch up with us on, you know, going through the whole book all the bo- books of the Bible. When we get this new platform, it's going to be so cool. It's not going to be housed on YouTube anymore. It's going to be housed on our new website, so YouTube will not be able to cut and slice and dice like they have in the past. (laughs) They have edited our messages. They have cut sections out. So on this new platform, they won't be able to do that. And all of our our services will be listed by title and date. And so you'll be able to go back and say, well, I wasn't there for that, and I want to catch up on this one, and it'll be real easy, user-friendly to do it. And so if you remember, one of the challenges that Paul had because of the culture, you have a Roman culture, and what did they do? They served gods. You have a Greek culture, what did they do? They served gods. And the problem was you had it in the Old Testament, and the problem we had in the Old Testament was the Jewish people were marrying the women from other nations that served gods. And so when you look at the men that were in leadership, they got in trouble because they were marrying women that had other gods they served. And so the men that were supposed to be the godly Jewish leader, they would marry these women because they couldn't control their hormones. And Paul even says, First Timothy here, hey, 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 don't you get caught up in that lust. Hey, 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 slow down. There's a whole book, a whole, whole section of the Bible that shows men that were supposed to be Jewish leaders that got them in trouble because they came together with a pagan woman from a pagan culture that served multiple gods and they tried to bring it and blend it in. And that is the downfall of the Jewish people. And we can even go to David. But yet, who did Jesus come from? Jesus came from the lineage of David. And he's a God man after God's own heart. How can he be a man's after God's own heart? Because of the grace of God. So that's a lesson that no matter where you are in your life, whatever train wreck you've become in your life, you cannot do anything so bad that God will not pick you up, forgive you, and get you back on the track. And so for visitors, we're the perfect church for those who aren't because we're all train wrecks. And I'm the and I'm the and I'm the I'm the engineer of the train, man. I'm the biggest train wreck in the crew. And so Paul begins to instruct Timothy. So I want to go back to and start in first. Tim, uh, I mean, Second Timothy, the first chapter. I'm going to jump down to part of verse three. Well, I'll just read it all. It says, Timothy, I thank God for you, my dear son. Now that's just not. We have to understand, anytime you read stuff like this in the, in the Bible, always understand that it means more than what you see. <laughs> because it was written in a culture that words had meaning. You know, this, this thing about, you know, my word is my bond has left more of us hanging <laughs> 
because somebody broke their bond. My grandfather and the farming and the ranching and the dirt construction business as a kid, I would see him shake hands on dirt jobs that were multi-million dollar dirt jobs and there was no paperwork. He would meet with them. He would say, this is what I believe it's going to cost. This is how much dirt I think we're going to have to move. You know, he'd grab a handful of soil. He'd mix it. He'd rub down. He'd kick it around. He'd get a good feel of the soil. They'd tell him what he had to do and he would eyeball that stinking job. I'm, th I'm talking roads, major dams, you know, stuff for the state of New Mexico. He would eyeball that stuff. They would look at him and give him plans. He'd give the plans back. They said, don't you want it? Give us a bid. He said, no, I can give you a bid. He didn't go study it. He could eyeball it. And you know what? He'd get the dadgum job. And they'd shake hands. Can you imagine that being done today? I mean, you'd be in lawsuits. You'd be all bound up. I mean, he, he, he was that good. And that was his reputation. His name was Jesse Little. Jesse Little was reputation is that one, he's a nice man, but do not mess with Jesse. Quiet man. But if you crossed him, oh, Jesus be for you. And he wouldn't get mad. But you just, you, when he got done with you, you knew you had crossed the wrong line. But he had a reputation of being a man that when his word was his word, and if he missed a job and it took more, he didn't go back and charge. He ate the loss. And it can at times be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But that was just him. And I'd always look at him and go, are you crazy? And that was never a good phrase to say to my grandfather. Because <laughs> I always got a lesson out of that. And so when you read this, when he says, my dear son, it's just not a phrase. The meaning behind that was so deep. The connection was so deep. It, it, it was deeper or deeper than, because, you know, blood doesn't make you tight. You know that? That's just true. Just because you're blood related doesn't make you tight. What makes you tight is a bond. And these, Paul and Timothy had a bond that was unbreakable. Because when it's all said and done, everybody in second, that followed Timothy, or Paul, at the end of 2 Timothy, they all left him to die alone. Except for Luke. And Timothy was in Ephesus. But Timothy was with him in spirit and was writing to him. But Luke was the only person. All the people that had followed Paul for all these years. They vanished. You know why they vanished? Because the more he stood and preached the word, the more he got in trouble, the more he got jailed. And his followers did not want to be, they were embarrassed by him because he went to jail. False disciples. Luke was the only guy that was there when Paul was killed. Timothy was there in spirit. So he says, I thank God, and in verse 3, he says, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience. He was unafraid. He was not ashamed of who he served, Paul was saying, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remembered you in my prayers. Folks, that's a call for us. Night and day. Not occasionally. Not when it's convenient. Night and day. Night and day. I, I, I just stuck. You know, we talked to lawyers, great song, guys, great song. Thank you. It fit in and you didn't even know it. We talked to all these other people. But you know what? God always seems to get on the back burner. Well, I pray when I drive. Really? Not if you drive the canyon. You ain't, you're, you're praying to live <laughs> if you drive the canyon. Don't give me this, I'm praying, you know. Got Johnny Paycheck blaring, dodging semis, and talking to God. No, talking to God is just taking a few minutes. God is more honored by us taking 30 seconds of quiet time just to focus on him than 30 minutes driving someplace and being all these distractions, phone calls, and trying to get back to him. He is more honored by our 30 seconds because it's committed to him. And he doesn't take second place to a phone call or an interruption of a child or interruption of a news story. It's just 30 seconds. And it should be more than 30 seconds. But he said, I pray for you day and night. 
down to first, verse 5. I remember your genuine faith. That's for real. Genuine in the Greek means that there is no uh, there's no grit in it. There's no grime. There's no imperfection. And remember, I told you that the, you know, the scripture talks about the potter. There were real potters and fake potters. Real potters would take it and they'd form it into a bowl. They'd form it into a vessel that would hold water. And a real potter would hold it up. And if there were any cracks, he'd smash it. He'd throw it back in the kennel and he'd redo it. And he'd come back because he didn't want any cracks because these people got water from you know basins and they got water from river. They didn't have indoor plumbing and they didn't want them to lose. It. A fake potter would put it up and look at it. It was hot in Israel. It was hot out in the desert. Fake potter would look up. He'd see holes. He'd take wax. He'd fill in the wax, that type of stuff, you know, sell it to the people as much as for a real one, if not for more. And then they'd take it home, fill it with water. The heat would come. The wax would come out of it. And they had no water. And they didn't have money to go buy another one. And so Jesus is a real potter. He looks at us. He sees our cracks. He cleans us up. He fixes us. He didn't put a substitute in there. You know, he heals us. And how does he heal us? He heals us through his word. And so our faith is to be genuine. Share the faith. He says, for you, share the faith that first filled your grandmother. So grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid hands on you. In other words, the impact that we have on other generations, and that's the problem. Parents no longer depend on raising their kids. We have school systems that are raising their kids. We have parents that don't know how to cope with all the kid, things kids are going through, the transgender stuff. You know, I just, the, uh, a lady, a young girl that was in her teens, uh, I believe it was in Oklahoma, now just this week I saw it, she transgendered, went through all the change, the hormone, into a boy, and her parents let her to make that decision at 15. Folks, a 15-year-old, and no disrespect, you know, but 15-year-olds, I mean, you know, from 12 to 18, we're just aliens. We just are. We don't know what we're doing. We're growing, you know. You know, girls mature faster, you know, and some skinny little 90-pound guy, you know, that's got acne, falls in love with, you know, some good-looking girl and walks up and goes, hey, how you doing? And they're like, really? You know, we're just geeky, you know. Kids are growing so fast. I got a grandson. You know, I went and bought him a new pair of boots. Good grief. He got more boot than he's got the rest of his body. You know, you see kids and their arms are like this. They're growing. You know, can't find shirts for them because one arm's longer than the other one. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's magic right there. That's magic. <laughs> And, and so you let them make a life decision, and you know what this, this, this young person did this couple weeks ago? She admitted that she had made a terrible mistake, that her life cannot ever go back to being normal. So the solution was she killed herself. And she was one of the first ones to make national news. And she named herself Next Leopold. And if you go look that name up next, Leopold, she was one of the first to do that. You see, parents allowing their kids to make those kind of decisions are guilty for the destruction of a generation. We have parents that don't want to be inconvenienced. We have parents that are struggling to make end meet because of our, our economic culture. We have, we have parents that don't realize that when they attack one another, what they're doing to their kids. Talked to a friend this week. They're going through a bad marriage situation. And the thing that they said is, uh, the kids are beginning to notice the behavior of the other one and they're acting out and they're teenagers and they're mad and they're resentful and I'm the one having to fix it but I'm getting blamed and it's not that person's fault it's the other person who is disengaged and is hateful and mean and they're Christian kids see this stuff and so 
this influence of Timothy's mother and grandmother is put him on, on, the, on the trajectory to be one of the great disciples of Paul. So then it goes down to verse 8, and this should be all of us. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. We're so afraid people are going to, you know, say something to us. Really? Folks, here's the deal. When we live our life based on other people's opinion, you know who's controlling how we live our life? Other people. You, you just, you, you, you have to get to the place. You have to get to the place that, that you say that the only thing that defines me is what God says. Now, I'm going to get real here. Husbands and wives, you're not going to define each other. You're, you're not going to complete each other. And, and, and I can say this because I've been on the marriage track and I've learned. If, if you have to compromise who you are to survive in a marriage and it takes away from your biblical beliefs, you're being controlled. And that's one of Satan's greatest tools. If, if you're a widow, and we have widows and widowers in this church, you know, that have been married for 40, 50, 60 years, and they lose a spouse, I get it. My parents were married almost 60 years. My dad passed 12 years ago. I've watched this journey with my mother. I, I, I have seen the, the brokenness of dad not being there, that the identity is, is gone. I, I'm not the wife anymore. I'm who am I and, and that type of thing. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, is we are to complement, but what defines us is our walk with Jesus. And our walk with Jesus and the spirit of strength that he gives us is what helps us grow through that pain. And I promise you, for whatever season of pain you've gone through in your life, just as Paul speaks to Timothy, Paul turns around and tells Timothy, I understand what you're going to go through because I have gone through, and he becomes an encourager. If you've gone through pain and loss, you have the ability to be an encourager to those you have the ability to lift other people up. That's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians when he talks about the God of all comfort. So he says, never be ashamed. Next week is Easter, folks. Next week is Easter. We should have more people. You know, if everybody that comes to our church came on the same Sunday, we wouldn't have enough chairs. If everybody comes to church next week and invites somebody, guess what? Bleachers have got to come out. One person invite one person. What a great opportunity. Get those little cards, invite people this week. This is a great opportunity. People tend to come to church more on Christmas and Easter than any other time. And the number one reason people say they don't is because nobody asks them. You don't have to preach the gospel to them. Just say, hey, Easter's coming. Love to invite you to come. Let me preach the gospel to them. Just get the bodies here. I'll, I'll take care of that. I'll share the good news. And that's what Paul's telling Timothy. Down to verse 9, he said, For God saved us and called us to a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time. Go Genesis 3.15. First prophetic statement about Jesus and Satan in the battle. And in the end, one crushes the heel, which is what Satan did on the cross to Jesus. But what does Jesus do in the end? It says he crushes Satan's skull. He kills him dead. And that verse is permeated throughout all and every book of the Bible. And when we finish this series on that last Sunday, I'm going to show you, starting in Genesis to Revelation, where Jesus was in every book in the Bible, he is there. He played a role in every book of the Bible. 
And so then it goes down verse uh, down to verse uh, 10. And now he has made all of this plan to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. You see, believers can deal with death because we have the hope of the resurrection. We have the hope of eternal life. Non-believers, what do you do? Well, they just go back to the dirt. We have the hope and the promise. It doesn't take away the pain, doesn't take away the loss, doesn't take away the hurt. I think about my dad every day for 12 years. I think about him several times. We laugh at him because he's not here and we can get away with it. He did a lot of goofy things. I'm doing some of those same goofy things with my grandkids. You know, things that my dad used to bug me, bug me. now I'm doing to my grandkids. And I'm thinking it's cool. <laughs> I'm a cool granddad. You know, my dad did that to me. I'm like, come on, dude. You know, back in the day, I got, I got my youngest grandson. He's stop it, Papa. Ain't no way. You tell me to stop it, just more of it. Love being a grandfather. So in verse 14, listen to this. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth. The truth. We have the truth as believers that has been entrusted to you. We get that? It's been entrusted to you and I. You, you, in fact, Paul says again the word command. He says, Timothy, command people. What did we, what is, we talk, if you remember when we talked about the word command, what does it mean? To give power over. It's not, I command you to do this or you're in trouble. It's a command, and in the Greek, it means to give us power over the dominion of evil. To give us power to stand strong to these things. And you go down into, and you'll see there in verse 14, he goes on and he talks about, as you, in, in verse 15, as you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me. And those two names there, those were two of his closest disciples. And they said, you're an embarrassment to us because you're getting in trouble. And, and we don't want to get into trouble. We don't want to pay the sacrifice you're going to pay, so we're going to bolt. You know what that was? That was the beginning of the great apostasy. <laughs> the great apostasy that we've already talked about started back in the day of Paul. Started back in the day of Jesus because people didn't want to be claimed. Peter started it, I believe, because three times he denied Jesus and Jesus told him was. That was apostasy on Peter's part. He left. He was an apostate. He turned his back. But by the grace of God, what did Peter do? Peter came back and he preached the very first message of the gospel outside of Jesus. That started the church. That's the power of God's grace. Verse chapter 2, real quick, it says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through what? Through grace that God gives us. Then he goes on to verse 3, endure sufferings along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Are soldiers wimps? No. Soldiers are strong. They stand in the battle. You know, our, 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 our soldiers are just not men in the military. You know, I, I understand. I got a, I got a son-in-law in the military. I got a son-in-law that may be deployed, you know, possibly to a, another country. And my daughter and grandkids go because of what's going on in this world. And, and, and he's going to be there. And I've never been involved in the military, never served in the military. Now I begin to understand. I see the challenges that my daughter goes through for the military wives. They've got to be strong. And you also have to be strong. The men and women every day that get on the streets of our country and protect us. They have to be strong. And they don't get to sit back and go, I don't want to do this. It's the job. One of the songs that they're going to be playing at the funeral is a song I love by George Strait called The Weight of the Badge. And in, in that song, they take, you got to listen to it, they take testimonies of wives saying that when he puts the badge on and he leaves, I hug him a little bit longer. I hug him a little bit harder. Or I hug her. The weight of the badge, the weight of the badge. The weight of the badge is every day putting their life at risk, not knowing. They may think it's a normal day. Justin thought it was a normal day. Justin was the ultimate good Samaritan. And it cost him his life because evil prevailed. 
And he didn't challenge it. I have a situation going on in the back that will, is being taken care of. Okay. So we got to be strong. So he, he, he aligns us to be strong as a soldier. Soldiers don't get fed up in the affair or tied up in the affairs of civilian life. What's that mean? For then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. What does that mean? They don't get tied up. In other words, they don't get sidetracked by a bunch of nonsense. They stay focused on what's ahead of them. They stay focused on the enemy. They have to be aware. If you talk to somebody who is a law enforcement or a first responder, they have a thing that they learn to have called hypersensitivity. Hyper awareness. That they are constantly aware of their surroundings. It is, it is built into their training so that they can survive. And I bet you the spouses love it. Sitting in a restaurant trying to have a nice meal and all of a sudden they catch an eye. <laughs> and all of a sudden the eye no longer goes toward the spouse, but it goes toward the situation. Right? And the wife knows the look. They know the look. When we had 60-some people go through our concealed carry class, I love that about us. And I'm still making fun of you men because the women outshot most of us. What did he say? He said to us, his wife knows the look. And when she sees the look, he has trained her what she needs to do. And what was funny, what she needs to do, and she does, <laughs> she pulls her 357 out of her purse. <laughs> <laughs> but she's been trained. We as Christians are to be aware of what the enemy is trying to do, trying to catch us into things, trying to make subtle things look subtle when they're really major things. And so he goes on and he says real quick, he says, and athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their, of their labor. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all things. In other words, athlete, soldier, farmer, what do they do? They're aware they're strong. They have to be aware. Farmers have to be aware of the fields and watch the weeds. Farmers have to take care of their crops and make sure they get water. They get the nutrients to survive. As Christians, we have to do the same in our life. As a warrior, we have to be aware. What does the Bible say? That the devil has evil schemes and they look to be good. They look to be light. They look to be beautiful. And next thing we know, we go, how did we get here? How did we get sucked up in this relationship? How did we get sucked up in this thought process? How did we get sucked up in, in this addiction? Because it was a subtle thing. And the next thing we know, because Satan made it look good. And next thing we know, we're in the midst of something evil. So we've got to be aware. We've got to be an athlete. We've got to train ourselves. You know, since I've been sick, I've been starting to train, and I went to physical therapy, and I'm doing weights, and, and bought me this new weight machine, and I got these rubber, you know, retention things that you do and all this, and I'm watching all these videos on TV, and you know the exercises don't mean nothing? They don't mean anything. You know why? Because if you don't do them properly, you're wasting your time. Just pick it up and put a weight and doing this, and you're wasting your time. Because it doesn't train the muscle. There's certain placements of where your wrist has to be if you're using a dumbbell. There's certain movement of the shoulder. There's certain placement of the elbow. There's certain ways to sit because where you sit, standing or sitting, moves different muscles. And I'm like, Dad, gum, it'll take me a year. I'll have a doctorate in kinesiology by the time I get done understanding how you use your muscles to get in shape. And you know the biggest muscle you have and why all of us have problems? Your butt muscle. That's the biggest muscle in the body. It supports the back. It supports the legs. It supports the core. If your butt doesn't have any shape to it, if your blessed assurance is not in shape, you got problems. 
So I do this exercise every night because after COVID, I was concerned because I looked back there and nothing was there. <laughs> and then after my seven months being as sick as I was and all that, it was definitely gone. There was a bone there. That's it. Some of you are going, that's too graphic. <laughs> but I start doing this one exercise. I do a hundred times every night. I do it. It's called a bridge. Look it up. And I guarantee you, woo, <laughs> my honey's getting sexy. <laughs> Some of you are going, okay, yeah, that's too much, preacher. <laughs> Welcome to Cowboy Church. I'm going to tell you what it does. I don't have near the back pain. I have better leg strength. I have better core strength. When I get on a horse, I sit different. When I sit in a chair, even with the minimal weight that I can lift now, I'm able to whiff, lift, lift it, lift it. You know, you, know what hap- you know why that's there? Not because I ignored it, because I trained it. See, he's using this to say if you're going to be in shape, you have to train it. If you're going to be in shape spiritually, you have to train it. And then I'm going to finish on this. Over in verse 3. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ. Endure suffering as a good soldier of Christ. Then down, it says past verse 9, but the word of God cannot be chained. Do you know, folks, that people have been trying to get rid of the Word of God since the Word of God and the teachings of the disciples have come out. Emperors, kings, people have tried to destroy this forever. And it still lives. It still is. It still is the book that is printed the most. And so the promise that we have is this, this is a true saying, trustworthy saying. This is what God does. This is the promise. If we know him, if we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains unfaithful. For he cannot deny who he is. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have the time to do church and walk this life and just be convenient about it. Somewhere in your life, whether it was a parent like Timothy's mother or grandmother or a father, somewhere in your life, whether young or old, somebody spoke to you about the love of Christ. And as a result of that, you're here today. Where would you be without that? Could have been a Sunday school teacher. Could have been a stranger. So the thought is, is that if somebody didn't invest in my life, where would I be today? We have to look at that as others. How do we invest in people's lives? And everybody gets all shook up thinking, oh, I got to, I got to, I got to, quote all these scriptures, I got to say, no, you don't. No, you don't. Somebody says, why are you that way? You know, I learned something a long time ago, changed my life. What was that? Oh, I met this guy named Jesus. That's all you have to say. You planted a seed. That's all you have to say. Walk off. You know what God will do with that seed? He'll send somebody to water that seed. He may have to send a bunch of people. But if we just can't simply say, change my life, I met this guy named Jesus, then we're denying him. We don't have to get into a theological debate. Invite them here. Let me do that. If they want to pick me apart, let them pick me apart. That's, that's what I get paid for. Get picked apart, called names, accused. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it. I'm a grown man. That's what Paul was telling Timothy. Be strong. Be strong. For those of us that are called in the ministry, folks, we don't have an option but to be strong. 
Some think they have an option and they've damaged the truth. I don't have an option. I just, I don't. I, I, I can't, I don't, I'm not, I can't. Do you understand that? I, I can't do it. Even when I've tried to compromise, I have been miserable and I have spent time trying to save, save a relationship by compromising and I couldn't do it. And it cost the relationship. So I, I'm, that's how God's wired me. And I, I'll take the hits. I'll take the criticism. I'll take the shots. I'm not worried about it. Because I know where I'm, I have the confidence to know where I stand in God. And I'm going to tell you, after seven months, and I'll shut up, I promise, after seven months, of going through what I went through and being told that I had just a few days to live. I came out of there and went, you know what? I got nothing to lose. I got nothing to lose. And so I came out with a different version of Kurt Miller. And some of you are going, oh, great. <laughs> I just came out with this, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not playing games with people who want to play games, whether it's a pastor of a church or people in a church. I'm not, I, I, it doesn't matter to me if we run 10,000 or 10. I, I'm not, it's about the message and you fight for the integrity of the gospel. That's the fight that I have. And I will not compromise that. Will not compromise that. And I pray that you guys are with me on that game. Because if you're not, I know some special forces guys. And they can help remove your presence in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. I love you folks. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for listening. I don't apologize for taking so much time. You know, I've just kind of gotten over people getting upset because I take so much time because they got to run home because they got a pattern and a habit to follow. Eat lunch after church. Go do this. Take a nap. Go do this. You know what? My, my response to that is shut up. Just, just shut up. Don't marginalize God that way. You know, for some of us, Sunday is all we get of God. You know, we get so caught up. So what? You know? So when you look around and you see people that aren't here today because the weather got windy or, you know, it's too snowy or whatever, go home, pick up the phone. Call them, encourage them. You know? Call them, encourage them. We don't walk away from church because it's tough to get to. Can you imagine if Jesus said, well, I don't think, you know, I don't think I want to die today, God. It's going to be a little windy. It's too cold for me to be on that cross, God. You know, he even asked God, can I get out of this? God said no. He could have called 10,000. He could have called and got, you know. No, he didn't. But yet we as Christians, it's all about convenience. It's not about commitment. God, folks, we need commitment in this world or, or we're going to be, we're going to lose it all. We're in bad shape. We're being lied to. Believers got to come together, take a stand, show up in full force. Not to say we have the numbers, but to show Satan that we're not playing this game and to honor God and Jesus for what they've done for us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for our people and being here. And God, I challenge that you just give us this desire to want to grow, to want to learn. Uh, Father, that God, we would just realize that the time is short. And some people as believers don't even want to accept that. God, we need you. We need to be fired up. We, we need to be rattled. We, we need to change, God. So, Father, I pray for just a radical movement in our church. Father, we come to you with the Hare family. God, I, sometimes I just run out of words. don't even know how to pray just get so angry and frustrated about the evil. 
God, sometimes it's your emotions just get so out of whack that you just want to take control of an evil situation and take you out of the equation. That's so hard, God. But Father, I thank you that you teach us in your word that revenge is yours and that you will judge the evil. And so, Father, I pray that you judge the evil, but I also pray that you raise up the believers. Because it's no longer right or wrong, God. It's good versus evil. And Father, we as Christians got to get serious about this. We got to get serious about this. Father, I pray for blessing on this church. Thank you for all you've done. This is your church. This is your bride. I thank you for people that come each Sunday. I pray for them and their lives, those that are hurting, those that are struggling. I pray for David and Marcella and the family as they go through this terrible journey they'll have to face this week and the loss of a son. Can't imagine it, God. I pray that you take this situation in their lives and the others that have lost and you heal them and then use it for them to touch lives and make a difference. Father, thank you for grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.